Milliken. Murray is an R.A. Milliken Professor Emeritus at Caltech, Distinguished Fellow, and one of the founders of the Santa Fe Institute. Please join in me in welcoming him as he introduces tonight's speaker. Thank you, Lowell. Good evening. It's a great pleasure to help welcome you to this second lecture in this year's series, named after my old friend Stan Lum. If he were alive, I'm sure he would be proud to be associated with our lecturer, J. Doan Farmer. And I'm delighted to have this opportunity to express in public my admiration of Doan as a scientist and as a person. For this introduction, however, the authorities at our institute tried to find another icon like the one that introduced Doan last night, <laughs> but they failed, uh, one of our rare technical failures, and so they were forced to call on me, even though I have great trouble morphing into an ape, <laughs> or into W, or a mixture of the two. Uh, you know that... Um, Doan and his colleagues had a great deal of success at the prediction company using past fluctuations in financial markets to make probabilistic predictions of future fluctuations. And many prominent people said, of course, that that couldn't be done. Eventually, Doan decided that he could afford to embrace academic life. And he joined us as a research professor to my great delight. One subject he's studying at the Santa Fe Institute, along with a number of bright associates, is why investors' behavior allowed the prediction company to make money, as they did. <laughs> and that's just part of a very general interest in mathematical regularities in human affairs that Doan and I share. And uh, we, we both want to understand some of these regularities and answer some questions about them, such as, how robust are they? How much do they constrain the future? How much do they limit the effects of public policy decisions? And of course, many of you are familiar with uh, a number of these regularities, uh, really quite mysterious. Why does Moore's Law hold, which says that the uh, uh, amount of information on a computer chip doubles every half hour or whatever it is? Uh, <laughs> I mean, how was Gordon able to predict that years ago, and why is it still true? Uh, you know, there's constant relative rate of increase. Uh, it's claimed uh, that, for example, in France, the maximum speed of human transport has gone up by a constant percentage, uh, for a constant percentage per unit time, for two centuries, through changes from foot to horse to carriage to Railroad to car to plane to jet plane and so on. Very bizarre. And of course, these exponentials eventually have to level off. And then they become S-curves. But there's a very simple S-curve, the so-called logistic curve, that explains enormous numbers of things. The, um, or describes, I should say, enormous numbers of things, like cumulative casualties in a war or a plague, uh, cumulative scientific output, cumulative musical output, so on and so forth. All very fascinating. Doan's interest in this kind of thing goes back quite a long time. He uh, w was at the Center for Nonlinear Studies at the Los Alamos Lab, CNLS, uh, around the time when the Institute was really getting started properly. And he and his friends organized at that time a wonderful meeting at the lab on evolution, learning, and games. And that meeting played a very important part in the development of SFI, I think. It fitted in perfectly with what we were hoping to accomplish. And some of the participants became regular visitors and others became occasional visitors to the Institute to our great benefit. 
Dolan is the same colorful character that he was at that time, almost 15 years ago, despite the absence now of the trademark red suspenders. They're still there in a way, even though you can't see them anymore. <laughs> now, last night, we saw and heard Dolan engaged in an argument with a bogus creationist slash intelligent design person. And he appeared to lose the argument, actually. I was rather unhappy about that. <laughs> but that's only because he was just being his kind, polite self. And tonight, I'm sure you will see him triumph over every adversity. Thank you. for a very kind introduction. And thanks to all of you for actually uh, making it out here for a second second time in a row. I, uh, and and uh, exhausted you so much last night that no one would have the energy to show up. So I appreciate you all being here. Um, let me also say, at one point last night, I said something that was obviously not in the career. And somebody just shouted out, what does that mean? And so do that if, if I do that again tonight. Um, <laughs> Pardon? Check the mute. Just a second. Mute. On. It's off. Power is on. Should be live. Mute. On. OK. It is on now. All right. Mute on. That's kind of a confusing terminology, anyway. <laughs> <coughs> um, OK. Um, so. See if I'm my slide advancer's working. Oh, did work. Something worked. Uh, there's, there's a demon back there that. You know, I don't think this is. Did I do that or did you do that? <laughs> All right. So I just I I, I I I I think most of you were probably here last night, and so I, I already explained why I'm using this title. So I, I don't think I'm going to do that again. But um, okay. So I just want to review um, what we did last night. Briefly, this was my outline. I went over entropy information and statistical mechanics, the history of the mechanistic view, what a machine was, the need for simpler copy machines, talked about biological versus human technology, and the amazing growth that human population has had. Now, um, I was urged to recapitulate the main points because I do have a tendency to go very fast. And that's another reason why people should shout out if I start being unclear because uh, I, I just go faster and faster like the human population. Um, OK, so first point is, why is the world propagated with functional structures? So the, I guess the phrase I, I made up for this is, propagation implies prevalence. That is, if, if there are things out there that propagate, those things will become prevalent and become the most common things. And, and those things are the machines. Um, the machines that are able to uh, store and harness information in order to do things that make them better able to propagate than just uh, uh, than, than, than other things. Now, I want to emphasize that I, my view on this is we aren't reducing the universe to just mechanics, rather that through processes of self-organization and dynamics, um, machines are capable of far more than previously thought. And um, to read a quote from C.H. Waddington, uh, vitalism amounted to the assertion that living things do not behave as though they were nothing but mechanisms constructed of mere material components. Um, but this presupposes that one knows what mere material components are and what kind of mechanisms they can be built of. And so I'll let you guys, it's a little, it's actually kind of a tricky because there's a double negative in there, which I always hate, but, but uh, Nonetheless, I think it, it, it gets across that idea very nicely. Um, if I could go back a slide. OK. Biological life, human artifacts, and human societies all evolve, and that relationship is becoming increasingly intimate, which was the main point of the last part of my talk. OK, now, rolling forward. 
Okay, this is the outline for tonight's talk. Um, I'm going to begin by trying to tie the talk in with, a, with the... Um, um, try to talk to... The, I try to tie this, this talk in with the, the other themes of the talk. I have to admit, I'm being a little self-indulgent here. I'm, I'm totally wedging prediction, com prediction in here because it's something I've been so involved in. But um, Okay. Um, and I'm going to give a review of different methods of prediction and some of my own, in his my own history and involvement in these different methods of prediction. Um, finally, um, or not finally, I'm also going to discuss a, some recent research over the last year at SFI, um, which has been very, you know, excuse me, don't, don't change that. <laughs> um, um, okay. Um, I'm going to give some of my own experience in, in or uh, sorry, some of the work we've been doing at SFI over the last uh, year, which has produced a market model that's, that's already had some remarkable success, and, uh, and so I'll, I'll share that with you. Um, it fits in, as, as the title describes, because it's a very mechanistic model, and it uses principles that are very different from standard economics. Um, then we're going to talk about what's maybe conceptually the more interesting aspect of this, how prediction can make reality more subjective and self-fulfilling versus self-defeating prophecies, and how the ability to predict interacts and changes the world and, and, and makes it more complicated is as evidenced by things like market manias and what I, what I would call other social schizophrenias. Um, so the final lecture, just, just um, as a plug, is to put some of this together at a more conceptual level, talk about purpose, what makes people happy, the debate on progress, the arrow of time, and a little bit, not too much, about morality and co cooperation and, and using my... Um, background and prediction to at least uh, make some predictions about the future, though if I were really smart, I wouldn't uh, stick my neck out and do that, because that's a notoriously unsuccessful uh, enterprise. Um, anyway, so on to the next, next slide here. So now, first I want to try and tie this in with the main theme of the whole series, which is that I see prediction as the computational component of any kind of purposeful behavior. Um, Purposeful behavior consists of three parts. Sensing, you have to know what's going on in the world. Prediction, you have to be able to predict what's going to happen next. And action, action is taken in order to take advantage of the prediction. And, and purposeful behavior and therefore prediction exist in the world because they're useful for propagation. <coughs> so even when you have something as simple as, say, a bacteria, swimming in a chemical gradient, that bacteria is making predictions about the world in order to decide which way to swim so that the bacteria can eat more than it would if it swam in the wrong direction. Um, all right. Now let me, let me just mention that this sensation prediction action is something that's often studied in, in the guise of control theory, a modern engineering discipline that grew out of cybernetics, which was, was in a sense an earlier incarnation of what's now called um, complex system. Okay, so next slide. Oh, yeah. I'm going to talk about methods of prediction. Um, in particular, I I'm going to argue that there are really three different aspects that determine the way one's a one goes about building a predictive model. One, one question is, relates to how the model is constructed. I mean, in physics, we like to construct models that are built out of what we call first principles. We, we, we observe the world. We create a model of the world that's, that's based on some deeper understanding of what, what happens. And as, say, Newton's laws in, in physics. And then we use that model to make predictions about the world. But there's an alternative approach, which is empirical modeling that I'll go, I'll go over. Actually, I realize I have slides on each of these, so I shouldn't explain too much detail. Now, the other question is, what does the model predict? That is, some models predict things going forward in time. Other models actually just predict contemporaneous things. They predict things about the relation of things that are, that are present. Um, and those models tend to have very different flavors. And finally, um, two of the basic models that we use are, on one hand, deterministic models, and on the other hand, random process models. So um, now I should mention, this is, not, this is how scientists do it. It's not the only way it's done. Here I give you an advertisement I actually received in the mail for the astrological prediction of stock prices. 
Um, um, you know, 100 app, great database. Um, uh, this doesn't fit into my paradigm, as far as I can tell. <laughs> um, next slide. Another example, there, here's an example of prediction based on numerology. And I don't, I've never really understood this, um, though the, the guy was actually nice enough to send me his book where all these pictures are contained. Um, it's actually a fairly well-respected financial analyst that a lot of people follow. Uh, so here on one end, he shows prices and how he believes they're built out of this magic sequence of numbers called the Fibonacci sequence. And on the other hand, he argues that the same sequence can explain um, why Frankenstein was popular in this era, and Mary Poppins appeared up here, and we went back to uh, splatter movies down here, and so um, anyway. I, I'm also, this doesn't quite seem to fit into my paradigm either, though it is a dynamical prediction. <coughs> um, now. So back to the, these three dichotomies. The, the first dichotomy is, how is the model constructed? I, I already went through this. Let me just, to construct a first principles model, you have to have a fairly high degree of sophistication. I would, I would say that roughly speaking, as far as we know, people and, and uh, people are just about the only things capable of doing this at this point. Now the other alternative is what I'm gonna call an empirical model is where you build a model empirically by just fitting historical data. For simple organisms like a bacteria swimming in a gradient, there's some hardwire model that's been tuned up by evolution. It's, it's wired in by genetics. The bacterium just knows what to do. For more complex organisms like, say, dogs, there may be further tuning by experience. There's some free parameters in this model that get set by play um, and, and simply by interacting the world so they get tuned up. Um, next slide. Now, so the other question is, what does the model predict? On one end, we have dynamical systems models, which predict the future based on the past and are fundamental to anything like, say, celestial mechanics. Um, in fact, they're fundamental to just anything we're predicting the future in science. The other are contemporaneous models that relate one property of the world to another at the same time. And this might not sound so interesting, but it can be very useful in simplifying our description of the world and make sure that we really understand what we're doing. Um, finally, there's what I might call the modeling paradigm. On one hand, we have the deterministic model where the world is described by a single point in state space that completely determines the future. And the rule that does this is called a dynamical system. I'll say what I mean by a state space in just a minute. Or random models where the evolution of future states is not necessarily determined by present states. And there's a continuum between these models, which is the one we more realistically typically work in. Um, okay, so the key idea to a dynamical prediction is a state space. The state is a list of numbers that gives the information needed to determine the future. So if you have n such numbers, it's often useful to think of them as defining an n-dimensional state space. So for example, if you're thinking about, say, a mass on a spring, the position and velocity of the spring from Newton's laws are sufficient to determine the future motion. Now, to think about that, we think about two axes, one that has the position and one that has the velocity. This is a trick that goes back to Galileo, I, I discovered in my research here. And, and it's sometimes hard for people to get used to because we call it a state space. It's not like real space in three dimensions, it's an imaginary space that involves abstract quantities, but those the axes of that space behave from a mathematical point of view just like real space that we're used to. So, so physicists or, or anybody who does dynamical systems talks about this all the time. Now, um, okay, so next slide. Now, as an example, how does a bacteria make this decision about which way to swim in the gradient? Well, the bacteria must somehow predict the concentration, in fact, the rate of change of concentration. So the bacteria senses the concentration of the point, swims around, senses it again. If it increased, it goes, aha, I must be swimming up the gradient, and so is, in, is then tends to swim in that same direction. If, on the other hand, the bacterium discovers the concentration has decreased, the bacteria says, up, oh, something's wrong, and it goes into the tumble mode. And when it discovers that the, bacteria, the concentration really isn't changing, it tends to go into eat mode. Um, okay, so in this case, the state space, it's very simple, it's just a number. It's the rate of change of the concentration. That's what the bacterium needs to know to know which way to swim. Now actually, in a three-dimensional world, 
it's really three numbers because there are three possible directions that that concentration is increasing. So the bacterium actually ideally wants to sense a vector. Um, but probably at any, given, at any given stage of the swim, the bacteria is just sensing the concentration along that direction. OK, we are not going to have the dynamical systems movie um, for various reasons. It's, it's a very old movie anyway, so what the heck. Um, I mean, I had, it had nostalgic value for me, but um, you, anyway, um, time limits. Um, I am going to try, by the way, much harder to try and finish on time tonight. I, I realize at the end I, I took at least an hour and a half, so um, I apologize. I am going to try and finish earlier. Now, an important aspect about the world that, 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 that I played a role in, in, in illuminating is the fact that there are limits to prediction. Um, they come from the fact that when we go into the state space and we think about the dynamical systems, the rules that actually move points around in state space, those rules, even from fairly simple equations, can, can be complicated. And they can be complicated in the sense that they're, they have stretching and folding. And I'll show you a picture in a minute of how that happens. They can produce behavior that looks random, even though it's in a purely deterministic setting. And where small uncertainties in initial measurements are amplified, um, limiting predictability. So next slide. Now this is put <coughs> better than I can. And I'll get some water while you guys read ahead. Um, by Poincaré, who interestingly realized this back in the, um, in the early 1900s. And, and, and we were studying something called the three-body problem. The problem with th three, when you have the sun and, say, say, two planets in a solar system. And he discovered that, that basically, that chaos could happen in there. Now, interestingly, this was somewhat lost from the mainstream science for, for almost 70 years. And or maybe more than 70 years. So let, let me, now that you've read it, I'll read it again just, just so you, you get the, the whole um, impact here. A very small cause which escapes our notice determines a considerable effect that we cannot fail to see. And then we say that the effect is due to chance. If we knew exactly the laws of nature and the situation of the universe at the initial moment, we could predict exactly the situation of that same universe at a succeeding moment. But even if it were the case that the natural laws had no longer any secret for us, we could still only know the initial situation approximately. If that enabled us to predict the succeeding situation with the same approximation, that is all we require. And we should say that the phenomenon had been predicted, that it is governed by laws. But it is not always so. It may happen that small differences in initial conditions produce very great ones in the final phenomenon. A small error in the former will produce an enormous error in the latter. Prediction becomes impossible, and we have the fortuitous phenomenon. So to go to the next slide, we're now going to see, I hope, a movie of Poincaré. And we're going to see a map. Imagine Poincaré's picture pasted on the plane. And now what we're going to see is that we're going to take the plane, and we're going to stretch it out. And in fact, what we stretch out, we stretch it out and then fold it back in. You can see how those pieces are coming back in. And we're seeing successive images of Poincaré as he gets stretched and then reinserted and stretched and reinserted and stretched and reinserted. And so if we keep running that forward, we eventually just end up with a gray background. So what we've just seen is a mixing machine take Mr. Poincaré and turn him uh, into mush. And now we're seeing that run backwards. OK. So um, all right. So Marcus, maybe just roll it slowly one more time. So um, if you, oh no, you're at, OK, all right, R roll it forward. OK, so we see him getting stretched. We see new images of him re reappear because they're being re reinserted. And they get more and more stretched. He gets more and more elongated. And so this is the kind of thing that's going on in state space somewhere whenever chaos is going on. Now, typically, it's not just reinsertion like this where you just cut it and stick it back in, but rather folding. Get stretched out, folded back, stretched out, and folded back, um, like when you're kneading bread dough. <coughs> now, I am also going to um, bravely try to do a live demonstration here. Um, I, I I'm have the feeling it's unlikely to work, but we'll see. Um, all right, can we like, blank that or white it? It doesn't really matter. We'll be able to see it. So now what I have here. Um, 
Actually, it's blocked, so you can't see it, but it's, it's a pendulum. There's just a pendulum and a few magnets down underneath. The pendulum is magnetic, so when I swing the, the pendulum, it interacts with the magnetic fields. And what I'm going to try and do is get the pendulum to take more or less the same motion on successive trials. So I'll pull the bob out here and let it go. You can see it does something kind of irregular. And in this case, it stops in the middle. Now, when I'm lucky, I'll actually get it to stop on one of these side magnets. I'm going to try and do the very same thing. Let me try it again. And see, every time I do this, it takes a somewhat different trajectory. Now, I, OK, there we get a, a more erratic orbit. Now, I did actually pull it off to the side, but, but um, uh, let me try that same one again. Oops. Uh, you can tell I swung it a bit too hard there. Um, now we're getting a nice, interesting orbit, though. And look, we actually get it to stick to that guy. Now, <laughs> now one more time, I'll try and do the same thing, and we'll see if it sticks to the same place or it ends up, does the same thing. OK, I got it in kind of a regular mode. Up, oh, knocked out of it. Now it's doing a more erratic orbit. Where is it going to end up? Nobody knows. I don't know, anyway. Oh, all right, there we go. OK. So. <laughs> yeah, right. Good idea. I should just quit right now. Um, OK. So the point I want to make here is that um, uh, chaos is a, a double-edged sword. That is, on one hand, it, it changed a lot of things because it meant that people, where they were looking at random phenomena, said, wait a minute, maybe, maybe, it's not just, maybe it's not just lots and lots of complicated things interacting. Maybe it's actually pretty simple, and there's some pattern there that we can find. Um, on the other hand, one of the things that, that uh, I and John Sidorovich and Jim Crutchfield, Bruce McNamara, and various others were, were involved in showing is that actually chaos is it's not just a negative thing that makes things harder for us. In some way, viewed in the background of a world where we thought lots of things were random processes, some things that looked really complex actually become much more simple on the short term. So systems that are otherwise believed to be random become predictable in the short term. And, and these are some examples of some of the systems that we worked on. Uh, simple mechanical oscillator we just demonstrated, um, fluid flow sunflat, that we're at least the methods for prediction that we came up, they were empirical methods for prediction, seem to produce um, better predictions. So um, next slide now. Now this is the one that I actually cut my teeth on here. This is a rolling ball on a circular track with a counter spinning inside track and some deflectors uh, and an obstacles sort of in between the final resting place. Um, the game of roulette, which is a classical physics problem that Newton could have solved. It's, it's, it's Newton's laws. Measuring position and velocity at a given point in time determines the future motion. That is, if you know the forces, it did take us, I don't know, four to six months to actually figure out what the forces were and convince ourselves we get it right. Wind resistance is the main one. The equation of motion looks kind of like this when you boil it down and you write out Newton's laws and simplify it. The rate of change of the velocity of the ball is some constant times the velocity squared. As I mentioned last night, this is the very same equation the human population follows, except the ball is slowing down, whereas the human population is speeding up. There's also some complications due to tilt. And the motion of the ball on the train, this turned out to be very important. It took us, me actually years to realize this was so important. Um, no, I should say it is chaotic. Oh, on a perfect track, is isn't chaotic. But prediction is difficult because of the circularity of the wheel. You know, you're not, you're not just predicting something that's just moving in a line. It's moving around and around a circle. And you care about the position within that circle. So it's kind of like taking two numbers and dividing one number by another number. If you change the number you're dividing by, it can have a big effect on the remainder. Because the, the, the final position is, is the remainder in this case. Um, the imperfections in the track and ball create turbulence. That is, the ball actually moves chaotically just because the, the track is imperfect and it gets jostled around 
and there's bouncing on cups, but this is all details. Next slide. Now this is the um, machine that we use to uh, make the prediction. Next slide. Uh, another view of the machine out of the shoe with a battery pack, the P double PC boards with wax in between. This is just illustrating that the predictions, the way in which the predictions worked or that they did work, that is, we would divide the wheel up into eight parts and look at the numbers in that part and predict which number we expected, compare the prediction to the actual, and so if it landed on the exact uh, octave we predicted, we'd mark here. If it landed minus two or minus three away, we'd mark here, and you can see that you do a lot better. Um, actually, you can also see the parameters are a bit off. The parameters would be a little adjusting here, but basically, the ball was very unlikely to land over here and very likely to land here, illustrating that it worked. This was our family of computers. They all had names, uh, Perry, <laughs> Cynthia, et cetera. This is the shag carpet of our Las Vegas hotel. Now, these are the copy machines. Uh, this is Norman Packard, and you might recognize the other guy. Um, this is illustrating the kind of technology we were using at the time and, and uh, the way in which the copy machine process worked. And this is, um, this, this is a typical trip. Norman and I would spend the entire time fixing computers, and everybody else would sit and wait and ask why they weren't ready to go yet and why, why they broke it. Um, next slide. So, this, my roulette experience illustrated a couple of things. One is it, it did introduce me to the idea of chaos, which when my friend Rob Shaw, who was playing the piano just now, uh, told me about, uh, immediately connected to because of that. Um, but also, I ended up creating prediction programs based on both of these principles. The first method was first principles. It worked very well, but it required a physicist to run it. And uh, we couldn't get enough physicists to really like doing this kind of thing, so later on we handed it off to professional gamblers. I did it via method two. By then I actually, I should have mentioned those other machines actually had four um, kilobytes of memory. I mean, that's 4,000 bytes. So it, we had to work very hard to write the machine program that, that would actually put, put it into that memory to create an operating system and a prediction algorithm. Um, uh, version two, we actually had 64,000 bytes by then and I could write it in a higher level language and include a fitting routine. Was, it was less accurate but more robust because these gamblers could actually adjust the parameters to make it work. Um, okay. Now, I'm going to inject certain personal things in here to illustrate this Poincaré's point about the fortuitous phenomenon. Um, and this is a theme that will come through the lecture, uh, making predictions can alter the future. After the book Eubonic Pie on this was published, Nevada passed a law against using computers to predict the outcome of a game. Uh, not just due to us, also due to some blackjack players. Um, they, were, they were taking advantage of non-randomness in card shuffles. Um, the Huxley Roulette Wheel Company designed a new roulette wheel with lower cups and more elastic balls to enhance the chaotic part. Um, winning players who place bets at the last minute are immediately asked to take their business elsewhere. <laughs> and, um, and, and I have to say it altered the rest of my life. Why? Because Prediction is a very useful skill, and, and once you learn how to do it, it's like when I was in college, I knew how to fix motorcycles, and this was a terrible thing, because pretty soon everybody I know who had a motorcycle was showing up on my doorstep asking me to fix their motorcycle. Now, this had a better effect than that. Um, next slide, please. This guy is partly responsible. He's in the audience here some night, or tonight. His name's Tom Anderson. The, the fact that I was doing that, in fact, the fact that I read, I was reflecting on this, that story I told you last night by Azek Asimov was out of his book collection, which I would not have been exposed to if, if, if he hadn't been the physics professor at Western New Mexico University. Now, why would he have been the physics professor at such a rinky-dink school? Um, because well, the story, I won't tell you here, it's a fascinating story, but it involves Joe McCarthy, Frank Oppenheimer, and his uncle who had a gold mine in West Texas. So because of Joe McCarthy and his uncle, I, okay, I'm here tonight talking about, about this because once I did roulette, then everybody always wanted me to, I, I just, you can't stay away from prediction problems because, because it's too useful. Everybody keeps dragging you back into it. And, um, and so anyway, that got me interested in all this stuff and now you're all here. So we've all been affected by that. <laughs> Go on to the next slide. Thanks. Now, the, um, the really hard prediction, next to the most really hard prediction problems, we'll get to the hardest ones in a minute, come when you have limits to short-term prediction. And they come from something called the curse of dimensionality. Remember I mentioned this idea of a state space, which is how many numbers do you have to have to predict something? 
And when that state space gets big, like when it takes, say, 50 numbers to predict something, so you have a 50 dimensional state space, then fitting models to pass data empirically be becomes an extremely difficult task. In fact, you now know about exponential functions because it was in last night's uh, lesson. Um, uh, it gets exponentially harder, and this is called the curse of dimensionality. Um, so the amount of data you need gets exponentially worse. And if you have high dimensionality plus chaos plus some uncert any uncertainty at all in initial conditions, some systems just become fundamentally unpredictable even for, for very short times. This is something uh, this cast of characters showed about 10 years ago. Now, so this is, tr this is one of the reasons. The weather isn't hard just because it's chaotic. It's hard because it's high dimensional and, and so it's very complicated in this sense. The economy is similar except that um, the economy is even worse because of this phenomenon called market efficiency. Thus, most economists believe the future price movements are fundamentally unpredictable and not just because of this curse of dimensionality. Um, the problem is if there are patterns in prices, profit-seeking behavior of participants will eliminate them so that, for example, if the price is going to rise, more people will buy, which drives the price up, so the price rise happens before anyone can take advantage of it. Economists don't actually phrase it that way because they don't like to, they don't think about dynamics. They just say it just happens. But I've actually built some models that break it down and, and this is, you see just this kind of thing happen. You see these patterns evolving as the agents evolve to take advantage of them. So it's another domain in which evolution plays a very important role. So the future is in some se sense pushed back to the present. Now the result is unpredictable arbitrage efficient prices that fully reflect available information. Now what this means is that you can't make money by betting on the patterns that were around. Now to first approximation this is a good model and you know part of my career prediction company part had to do with re really uh, uh, happened significantly because of uh, almost a dare of um, trying really from my brother-in-law Cookie who um, uh, told me about this and I didn't believe it and uh, so I just decided, you know, the only way you can really do it is to uh, get out there and actually show it works. Now I want to emphasize that what Prediction Company did in my pantheon of types of prediction was empirical. We had no first principles model. It was a dynamical prediction. We were overtly trying to predict the future. And we were doing this via, on something that was essentially very close to being a random process. There was a little bit of determinism, but most of it was random. Now of course we were trying to exploit that little bit Determinism. And we manage money under an inclusive relationship with the United Bank of Switzerland or Warburg Dillon Reed, which is a subsidiary. Um, I view this as a cerebellar approach to market forecasting. That is, we empirically search for patterns in historical data. Um, you know, like it's not a first principles model. In other words, it's in that category. The keys to, to making it work were feature extraction and the law of large numbers. That is, Think of feature extraction. If you look at how spider monkeys actually see things, and there have been a lot of experiments where people put probes in spider monkey brains, uh, famous experiments by Hubel and Wiesel, uh, two scientists who studied this, what they saw is that spider monkeys don't just directly process all the pixels in the image and shove them in the middle of their brain. They, they have detectors that break down what's in the image. So for example, you have uh, moving shadows, bands, um, uh, light and dark, perspective between their eyes. They're detectors to detect each of these features that are features that have evolved to be useful in their world. And only this much more high level description goes deeper into the brain to be processed, to be coded. And that's really what we did. Most of what prediction company researchers do is find features like that, except these all involve prices. We had a little more understanding of the origin of the patterns, and we relied on abundant past data and stationary conditions. The trading, by the way, was fully automated, so there were no human decisions. So we created a kind of uh, unconscious organism that could process lots more data than a person could process, do so automatically, and make trading decisions. Now, okay, here's the uh, Harvard Business Review uh, view of prediction company. Um, as you can see, there's a crystal ball and the uh, wire going back to hit the computer. Um, okay, um, now. This is just to illustrate the idea of efficient markets and um, why I think it's important, but on the other hand, uh, 
uh, one should not take it quite as seriously as the economists do. By the way, if efficient markets were exactly right, then prediction company should never have been able to stay in business. Um, now, this shows one of the signals. The model's built out of multiple signals that in some sense encapsulate different kinds of information. And it shows that back in 1975, the signal had about a 14% correlation against a two-year, oh, sorry, a two-week-ahead two set of future prices. And then we roll that along, predicting, and the correlation drops, and correlation dropping just means the prediction's getting worse. If the correlation goes to zero, the prediction's worthless. Now, you can see that this does decrease through time, so the market does indeed seem to be efficient. On the other hand, it takes 23 years for this decrease to happen, and this signal here is still tradable. So somehow, the economist's view is, is right in principle, but on, a, on much too slow a time scale. Now, even more puzzling to a mainstream economist is this signal, which um, actually grows through time and increases, which, according to efficient market theory, shouldn't happen. Now, what we think is that this is because these patterns are driven by human activity, people with needs in the market demanding things like, like risk reduction or liquidity, and I'll explain to you what that is in a little while, and so the need, the demand for these things was rising and the market was not able, the arbitrageurs were not, not able to track this very well. Now, um, okay, let's go on to the next chapter. <coughs> and we're getting out of the stuff that I've been doing at SFI recently. The direction of future prices is not the only interesting aspect of a market. There are other things that are, are also important to understand, like risk, for example. People are very concerned about the risk in their investments, which is awfully typically encompassed by something called volatility, I'll explain in a moment, or liquidity, which is the impact of trading on prices, and transaction costs, as evidenced by the bid-ask spread, which is the difference between the buying price and the selling price at any given moment. Now, these are nice to study as an academic because they're not directly affected by market efficiency. So unlike if you came up with a better way to predict prices and you published it in an academic research journal and it really worked, um, well, other people would go start doing it and it would go away and probably a lot faster than in that 23-year period. That, that pattern's probably hung around for 23 years because people have been fairly secretive about what they do. Um, so this is to illustrate what volatility is. Here I show some hypothetical price series. And this is a low volatility series. The price moves randomly around, but it, it doesn't drift too much. And down here, you can see the differences, the changes in price, and you can see that they're relatively smaller than they are over here, which is this example here, where we've turned up the volatility, and you see that the price now drifts at a much faster rate. So this market is much riskier than that market. And you generally, people prefer less risky markets. They don't like to you know, lose their entire um, uh, pension on, on a random fluctuation of the market. Now, this is an example of liquidity. I think I may have reversed the slides. Can you go one forward? OK, liquidity is how much does price change in response to a fluctuation in demand or an order. So if you go into the market and you say, I want to buy a million shares of XYZ.com, you're going to drive up the price of XYZ.com. And if you're buying those shares because you want to make profit on the price, you want to make profit on the price movements that other people cause, you're not going to make any money from the one that you cause. So, so that's what liquidity is about. This is this, you know, why you care about liquidity. Now, it, this is closely related to the slope of the supply and demand functions that are famous in economics. Um, OK, go back. So this is just an example. Oh, no, I did have these in the right order. I'm, I apologize. I, uh, excuse me. I have to go back and illustrate volatility now, because this is, this is an instance of measurement of volatility over a 115-year span, where the volatility is measured, in this case, as the standard deviation of daily prices in month intervals plotted for each month. Now, what does that mean? The standard deviation is just how much did the price vary during that month. So go back a slide again. OK, so this is a low standard deviation, and this is a high standard deviation. OK, forward, forward, all right, back to liquidity. Now, I think I explained this already, so go, go on one more slide. All right, now, I want to put this in the context of what perhaps the most classical model in economic finance. It's a model by Bachelier. It was created in 1900, and the model was that 
that prices describe a random walk. Now, Bachelier actually came up with this model five years before Einstein uh, came up with the same model to describe Brownian motion. Einstein was probably unaware of Bachelier. But, but so this, this is a very old, well-pedigreed model. Now, in such a model, the volatility, physicists call it the diffusion rate, the rate at which this jostling around happens, is a critical thing that you would like to understand. And one of the striking things to me in economics is that there really no, are no good ideas, I would say, about what determines the volatility of a random walk in prices. What is it about IBM that makes it be this volatile, whereas some other stock might be much more volatile or much less volatile? So um, let's just roll the slide forward. Now, how would an economist approach this problem? A typical economist would make, make an assumption that there are agents, it's fine, who act selfishly to maximize their own utility. Utility just means their own good. I mean, in the context of financial markets, it's typically just profits or money, though it might also involve something about risk. They might not like risk, so they might maximize their money subject to the fact that they're scared of risk. Um, the typical, typical model assumes perfect rationality, or the neo, typical neoclassical model, which dominated economics for the last 20 or 30 years. That's changing, and the basic program of economics now is to take perfect rationality and the other perfect assumptions behind the standard models and assume things like different information. So you go to the used car dealer, used car may really know a lot more about the car than you do, so there's asymmetric information in the bargaining process. Um, imperfect rationality, well, we may not all be perfectly rational. <laughs> Maybe a few of us, I don't know. Um, at least the people that were betting on that uh, astrology uh, scheme. Um, institutional constraints. Um, there are a lot of restrictions in markets that may prevent markets from doing exactly what they would do in the ideal case. Now, the typical economics model assumes that all the agents take in this information, they take their model, they value the prices, and the prices somehow come to the collective valuation of the agents, which is always a, it's a magic step that I've never liked in financial economics models. So I'm going to present an alternative, which is to look very carefully at the mechanism for making trades in a real market. Take the exact opposite assumption and assume the agent's behavior is random. And I think, I think of this as like designing a telephone exchange. Um, you know, every call, every time you make a call, you presumably have a perfectly good rational reason for making that call. But, but the phone company doesn't try and model telephone calls by interviewing all its customers and saying, well now, why do you make telephone calls? They, they, just, they just measure that there's a, a rate at which people make calls that varies based on the time of day. It's a, they assume it's a certain kind of random process called a Poisson process. And they, they then understand how if you have you know, tens of thousands of agents following Poisson processes, what the aggregate fluctuations are going to be and they design an exchange that can handle the calls most of the time. Now, up back, let me say this is a first principles model. That is, we're trying to understand something about how the market really works. It's a contemporaneous prediction, which is one of the reasons we don't have to worry about market efficiency, and it's a random process model. So that's how it fits in my taxonomy of different forecasting schemes. Next slide. So what's the development of the model? Well, first of all, begin with the simplest possible random order placement model, also designed to be simple to understand and analyze. Then we'll modify the model based on analysis of real data, and then we're going to evolve even more sophisticated or more sophisticated agents that, that mimic the evolutionary process in the market. Now, let me say that one of the surprising things to us is this simplest model actually worked far better than we ever imagined it could. Um, I want to introduce my collaborators. Julia Iori, who's at uh, King's College London, actually a physicist who works in, an, in a finance department now. Eric Smith, who's a postdoc at the Santa Fe Institute. Laszlo Gilmont, who's a graduate student from Hungary. Supriya Krishnamurti, a postdoc at the Santa Fe Institute. Marcus Daniels, who's the guy running the projector back there and, and provides all our computer support and a whole lot else. Ilya Zavko, graduate student from Croatia, and Paolo Fratelli, graduate student from Italy. Um, next slide. Um, so we're going to analyze what's called an order-driven market, which is the way a modern market works. If, if you want to, you know, you decide you want to buy IBM, 
there's two basic ways you can do it. You call your broker and you say, I really want IBM right now. You've got to go get it for me right this minute. So your broker would put a market order that's, that tells you to buy or sell a given number of shares at the best available price at that time. And that's all you specify is how many shares. Alternatively, you can specify a limit order, which is buy or sell a given number of shares at a specified price. It doesn't guarantee that you get execution, that is, that you actually make the trade. Because if the price doesn't come to you, if your price is too low, you're being too ambitious, well, nobody will take it. Now, patient traders use limit orders and impatient ones use market orders. So we now have a little animation to illustrate this. <coughs> this picture, buy orders are shown down here. Sell orders are shown up here. Prices are shown here. And so a, a, a really, if you're really chintzy, you place your buy order down here and just hope that the price moves to you and you manage to get a, a bargain. So the bargain hunters live down here. The anxious, more anxious people would put their orders up here, okay, at what's called the best bid, the best price being offered from the point of view of the sellers. Similarly, the really uh, chintzy sellers or um, patient sellers put their orders up here, and the, the more patient ones put them down here. And, and this height is the number of shares of demand or supply, this supply in this case, sitting at each price level in this, it's really a, a box, I mean, it's a computer that keeps track of all these orders. In the old days, people used to actually write it down, but now, now it's a, a computer box. And um, so just some more nomenclature, the spread <coughs> is this gap between the best bid and the best buy. Spread's important because if you immediately say buy, then sell, change your mind and sell. So if you buy, you're typically gonna get a price that's this, um, if you're, you come in as a buyer, you'll get this price. Come in as a seller, and, and, you're, and, you're, and you're, well, actually, I'm getting ahead of the story here. But wait just a moment. Um, so there's a best bid and the best ask. All right, let's, um, yeah, so let's show us what happens with patient trading. Patient trading, we're gonna, can you click? So we see new orders flowing into the market. So these are what we'll call non-marketable limit orders. They don't lead to an immediate transaction. We imagine them raining onto the price axis from the top and the bottom. Can you click again? So new, 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 new orders are just getting added. And, um, and so this limit order book is a storage device that's storing supply and demand. Okay, now that's a fairly special order because when that came in, we actually got, that was a better price to sell than anybody else was offering before. And so when that happened, the ask, the, the best ask got moved to a new value. Okay, is this clear to everybody? All right, um, next slide. Right now, suppose you're impatient. So when you're impatient, you submit a market order. And the market order has no limit price. It's just an order that says, this is, I just, just give them to me. I don't, I don't want to wait around. So um, can you click, All right, there's the bid and the ask. Now we depict the market order as this big, this big market order coming in. And now we're gonna see how that market order executes against the existing limit orders and creates trades every time it does so. So there's just a trade there with that guy, there's a trade there, there's a trade there, there's another trade here. And now we've just widened out, we've just changed the, the new ask price again. So we see how the price moves as orders flow into the market. Next slide. Now, if you have intermediate patience, you can do something like a marketable limit order, where what you what you actually submit a limit order, but it crosses. And we'll see this cross. So here's the bid and the ask. Here comes this marketable limit order. It's just like, it's, 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 as you can see, it's a price that's inside. It's a buy order, but it's inside of the sell orders. It's above the best ask. So now what happens is it executes sequentially against all of those, leaving whatever's left over there. Again, moving the best ask, all right? Now in our model, we, well, we make a simplification, that is we, we treat that actually as two events. We treat that as a market order that ate all that stuff up, followed by a limit order that got deposited there, but that's a detail. Next slide. The final thing you need to know about is order cancellation, that is people sometimes change their mind. They go, I don't wanna buy that anymore. So click, and you, stuff disappeared. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Oh, actually, try it again? Okay, you see some things disappeared here. Order cancellation. All right, now, basic model. So this is, it's a very simple model. <clears throat> we just assume that everything is random, 
the people just randomly place orders so they they place so orders with some random process and these arrows are to indicate orders just raining down from the sky at random and you'll notice that the cell or the new cell limit orders rain all the way from the bid that is the best buy price all the way up okay similarly the the buy limit orders rain all the way from the ask the the best best sell price all the way down so the ask is typically higher than the bid there's a region where these are overlapping now meanwhile we have market orders randomly arriving and randomly canceling against these these limit orders of the opposite sign so so buy market orders flow in and cancel against sell limit orders over here similarly sell market orders flow in and cancel against buy limit orders over here in addition, we've got this cancellation process. Now, I apologize for the Greek letters. Physicists just can't help but use Greek letters. Um, but so alpha is the parameter that describes limit orders, mu that describes market orders, and delta that describes cancellation. Um, and so what we're interested in is understanding the depth of the book at different times because it turns out it tells us about those other things like volatility, liquidity, and, and, uh, and the spread. Well, the spread you've already seen. Now, how does it tell us about volatility? Well, it tells us about volatility because as these orders arrive, the price drifts around. We're showing it centered at zero here, but really the price is drifting randomly. It's making a random walk of some kind as these orders arrive, and the volatility is determined by the rate at which that price drifts. The liquidity has to do with how much depth there is in the book. If the book's really deep, there are lots of people that want to sell, and you want to buy, then you're not going to move the price very much because there are plenty of buyers around. If on the other end there's very few, then, then the opposite is true. A big order like the one we saw in the picture will move the price a lot. Next slide. This is just an alternate representation. I, I, don't, I don't think I need to show this one really. Now, one of the amazing things about this model is that we've been able to use very simple physics methods and actually some more complicated physics methods too, but we've been able to use a lot of physics methods to understand these very fundamental quantities about the market. One of the, so I won't describe most of them, but this one is so simple, I'm, I'm gonna try. Okay, um, now, of course, everything's hard to figure out in a you know, lecture where the lecturer gives you three minutes and speaks fast, as I do, um, but okay. This, this, is, this is a technique that's used all the time in physics engi and engineering and, and essentially has never been used in economics. And it's a way of guessing the answers to things just by thinking about their dimensions and the way they're made up. So for example, suppose you want to guess the formula for the period of a pendulum. So you first of all, write down all the things it could depend on. Well, what could it depend on? It could depend on the mass. Seems like an important property of a pendulum. It could depend on the length. And it could depend on gravity, because it's gravity that's actually pushing the pendulum back and forth. And at least those are the things that I can think of. And so now, what thing could the formula be? Well, first thing you'll notice is that mass doesn't involve time, length doesn't involve time, gravity does, because gravity is an acceleration, or the acceleration of gravity has units of length per time squared. That is, it's the rate of change of a velocity and a velocity is the rate of change of position. So rate of change of position has units of position or length over time. So the rate of change of a velocity must have units of length over time squared. So, so okay, that's the only thing that has time. So that's got to be in the formula. But now time is on the bottom, so we've got to stick it on the bottom. We've got to take one over little g, okay, 32 feet per second per second. And furthermore, it's squared, so we've got to take a square root. Now, but we still don't have the units right because there's, there's a length floating around in, in G. So if we put, we see that we put a length up here, we cancel the length in here, and we get something with units of time. Now, one of the striking things about this is we just, you just pointed out that the mass doesn't enter. So I think that's kind of surprising. It seemed like the mass of the pendulum would have mattered, but it doesn't. Now, Galileo, interestingly, um, uh, who deduced this formula, um, and tested it famously while in church, um, watching the chandeliers in the church swing and taking his pulse, which gives you a clue why Galileo nearly got excommunicated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
Now, fortunately, we don't have to face that kind of thing anymore, um, just for play, but, although actually we may get excommunicated from the economics community, um, which does have a kind of papal aspect to it. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, now I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, so don't get too scared yet. But, um, but our model has five parameters. I explained three of them up here. The other ones we didn't even quite realize this right away, right away is a typical order size. Which, which has to do with the kind of granularity of the market. It's kind of like a beach. A beach with big rocks on it is different than a beach with really fine grades of sand. So this does turn out to be an important parameter. And the other one is the tick size. And the tick size is just prices move in discrete increments. They don't move continuously. They're a quanta of price, as the physicists would say. Now in our world, the basic dimensions change. We have shares, price, and time. So we still have time. But instead of, say, mass and length, we have shares and price. And, and in the next slide, you can see these parameters. We show their dimensions. And I, I show some simple formulas, the first three of which we derive, oh, the first two, no, the first three of which we derive by simply juggling the combinations of these first three parameters, guessing that somehow the first two weren't going to be as, the last two weren't going to be as important. These were the combinations that gave answers. Now, we got the right answers, it turns out, in these first three. This last one, the answer that we got by just doing this with these first three parameters, we immediately saw from simulating wasn't right. And we scratched our heads and we realized that this granularity has to be really important. And so we did some simulations. We did the simulations. We came up with this formula here. So this formula comes out of simulations. But notice, we have predictions for lots of stuff. We have predictions for the slope of the depth near the origin, which is that's how fast is the, is the depth of shares building up in the book that has to do with liquidity, with the spread, which has to do with the transaction cost for buying and selling, and with the volatility, which has to do with the rate at which the price jitters around. So next slide. Now, so these are the techniques we've used. It's a long story. You know, I managed to confuse audiences of physicists talking about all this stuff, and I confuse audiences of economists even more because they've never heard of any of this stuff. But um, Anyway, we'll go forward to the next slide, and I'll spare you guys that. Um, so we've actually been testing these predictions now. And here we see the trading screen for the London Stock Exchange. So this represents the electronic world that a trader in the London Stock Exchange lives in. And the state of the market is changed. Every time a trader pushes one of these buttons, one of these numbers will change, and the state of the market will change as a result. But I put it up because it does, in some sense, give you an idea of what the state of this, of this world is. I mean, you can see there's lots of numbers corresponding to depths of, of trading as you go away. There's some historical information. Uh, uh, you don't even know what's on the screen. Um, next slide. Let me just say, OK, actually, so now what we're going to see is a movie. And in this movie, we're going to see pictures just like the pictures you were seeing before. Except this is real data from the London Stock Exchange for the company Vodafone over some dates that I think will appear up in the top when the movie starts running. So now what we see is as we go forward in time, we see these orders changing in the limit order book as the, as the orders arrive. Now I think we're actually skipping several frames at a time as we run this. Um, you can see the time up there. Um, so, so and, and let me explain something else. The way we've displayed this, the midpoint price, that is the middle of the bid and the ask, is actually fixed in the middle of this movie. So that's fixed, and the, the, the prices that exist in, at the boundaries of the movie are shown out there at every instant in time. And you can see it's uh, now April 13, 2000. It's 9.06 and uh, you know, 9.07. And so anyway, you just, you just saw this kind of process unfolding. And the bid and the ask is changing. The depth is changing. Transactions are being made every time um, orders are placed or removed um, in, in this in this book. And, and you know, actually, it's funny. I'm not used to looking at it this at, at this speed because normally when it runs, it just blasts a day in about I don't know 15 seconds or something. But uh, if you aren't skilled at looking at it, I guess it's well, it can be a little incomprehensible. Anyway, this is a real market. So. Um, so let's go on to the next slide. So now, now we're testing on this data our predictions of the spread. 
which is this transaction between, it's the difference between the bid and the ask. Turns out that when we do the simulations, we see that our, we predicted this formula just from the dimensional analysis, the ratio of the market order rate to the limit order rate. Now actually there's a small correction to that that depends on some function of this granularity parameter, the typical order size. And then we divide it by, by, by the cancellation rate and the market order rate to make something that's non-dimensional. Physicists like to do that. Because <laughs> it gives you in some way a cleaner way of see what, seeing what's going on without being distracted by kind of simple stuff. Um, now, what we'll see is that what we just, well, I'll show you a prediction anyway, a comparison of a prediction computed using this formula by measuring day by day for each stock, I'll start with a specific stock and for multiple stocks, we measure what was the average market order flow rate for that day? What was the average limit order placement rate for that day? What was the cancellation rate for that day? What was the typical order size for that day? So we get a series of numbers for each day, we make a prediction for each day, we measure the same thing in the real data, and then we compare the prediction to the real thing. And let me emphasize before I go forward that this is, this is a kind of a model that physicists really like to make because it has no free parameters. That means that we've set all the parameters up there in advance. I mean, actually, physicists in a way don't like to make this kind of model because it's very scary. Because when you make the prediction, you're really sticking your neck out because you say, this is it. We're not going to fit any, any free parameters to it. I mean, we just measure these numbers, make a prediction, then we go look at the quantity. Murray, you're nodding your head. What? No, no, no. The, the function is a, a, a universal function that I will show you a plot of in a moment. Okay? The function is fixed from the simulation. There, there, there's no parameter to the function. Okay? Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, now, now, so here we see a comparison of our prediction to the actual thing. And so we see there's some scatter. This is for Vodafone. There's scatter around this. I mean, these predictions are not perfect, but we actually, even the simulation, they're not perfect because it's a random process. So there's random variation that causes this to scatter in the real simulation, in, in the simulation, much less the real thing. I have to say, when I saw this comparison, I was, I was stunned because it's very rare that you actually get to make a prediction like this a priori, go out and test it, and have it work so well. These numbers over here, basically what they, they tell you is about the slope of the fit, the parameters of the fit, and so on. Um, um, we are a little bit off on the slope, suggesting that, but that the linearity of this plot comes out with a t-statistic of 39. Now, what does that mean? It means it's really goddamn unlikely that we're wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, now, here is that function that Murray was worried about that, as I said, has no free parameters. This function, in fact, to first approximation, you can just take that function to be the number 0.45. Um, it does have a little bit of variation, and we do see that when we put in that variation, we get a little better prediction. Now, what surprised us is this is that function of, this is that non-dimensional parameter I mentioned. So we're getting rid of the dependence of the part we could, we could describe from dimensional analysis. And what we see is that the data even fits that part of the prediction, which we found, I found, 10 times as shocking as the first thing, which I already found pretty shocking. Now, to go on one more step, what we see is a comparison of our prediction of volatility, which is described by the somewhat more complicated formula up here. It involves more parameters. That it, for one thing, it involves this cancellation rate in a more, in a stronger way. It also involves this granularity parameter, the typical order size in a stronger way. So this prediction tests a lot more about the model. Furthermore, you know, the spread is, is what they, the economists call a microstructure property. It exists inside the book. It's, it's not something that, you know, you think about over time spans of the year. The volatility, this is the daily volatility. The, the fact that it exists on daily volatility, I'm, I'm now willing to bet it's going to work on weekly volatility, maybe even monthly volatility. We're really starting to predict something about, about the properties of the market that the economists won't just poo-poo as microstructure, and I should say only some economists would do that. There's a whole body of economists that work on microstructure. But, so the striking thing here again is that we get a straight line. This is a very fresh plot. The scale is off by about a factor of 100, and um, if I hadn't been preparing for these lectures, I would have been uh, talking to my graduate students to try and figure out why this discrepancy exists. But 
we're not so worried about that because just getting this, the, having the data roughly line up like this is already a big result. Now let me mention, this is not raw data anymore. These are bin data, so the data was bin in say groups of 100 points or so. And so each of these represents the average of 100 points that had uh, nearby predictive values. So this is really exciting to us because economics, yes? No, 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 it's a contemporaneous prediction. Okay, so what we do here is we take a year and a half worth of Vodafone data. For each day, we measure the, those, those, well, in this case, four parameters in this formula, which are, are order flow rates and order sizes. And then we also independently measure how much the price is moving around on that day, okay? And then we, we look at the actual is how much the price moved around on that day, and the prediction is, is is plotted here, and then we just plot, we bin up the predict the, the points, and then plot them against each other. Okay? Um, it's, it's a contemporaneous prediction. All right. Anyway, we're very excited by this because, I mean, in ec economics is a field where people, ju there just really aren't many models that, where you make, a, you make a model and the model actually fits the data in the style that models fit that data fits models in physics. In fact, um, you know, I've been looking into this and I'm not sure there are any models that work better than this in terms of that criteria. Possibly the Black-Scholes model for option pricing. Okay, next slide. Now, what a, we're actually, I've never, I have to say, I'm worried the predictions that I showed you in the previous, they're almost too good. Um, that's, uh, that's kind of a nice thing to worry about. Normally you have to worry about them not being good enough and work hard to make them better. The reason is because it's hard to believe that random order flow is really the whole story. I mean, people aren't that <coughs> stupid. They, they actually do do things that, that involve some cognitive function that presumably have something to do with setting prices. Um, and, and so we're, we're trying to improve it in a couple of ways. One way is to, to um, we view this demand for liquidity that act, acting as a food for arbitrage words. It's like an ecology. What do I mean there? Well, <clears throat> well, liquidity is you want to buy or sell. You know, you're, 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 your mom gets sick, you need to raise some money to pay the bills, you go out and buy, some, sell some of your stock. You walk in and say, I want to sell it. And you know, you're not gearing off, you don't have some rational model about prices, you just want cash. So that's what, what, what economists would call a liquidity demander. And in our model, all the market order traders are just liquidity demanders. They demand liquidity for random reasons. And, and the, Limit order guys are actually feeding off of those guys, but they're feeding off of them in a particularly dumb way. They're just randomly placing limit orders. So we're trying to make this world a little more um, realistic by actually having the predators in this artificial ecology, not our real ecology, uh, it's just a market ecology, um, making some models for the kind of predators that are actually out there, you know, the tigers and, and, uh, and so on. And so one kind of such predator is a market maker. Uh, another kind is somebody who exploits an order imbalance. I'll show you an example in a minute. Another kind is a technical trader. That's like the guy with the Fibonacci numbers, though actually he's got other stuff thrown in there. And let me say when you add in these guys, well, actually, I'll come back to that other bullet in a minute. Let's show the next slide. So this is a collaborator for the next slide. I'm going to show Jim Rutt, who's uh, uh, spending a year at the Santa Fe Institute, kind of uh, doing science as a hobby after being a see something O in some big tech company. Um, all right, so this is his view of the agent ecosystem that he's got this uh, market maker agent in Book Street. You've got different agents. The agents are interacting with each other. They're feeding off of the, um, the liquidity demanders and they are themselves co-evolving with each other as this goes along. Now the picture I'll show, we don't have this guy. We just have this guy. And what this guy does, excuse me, is look to see whether there's an order imbalance in the book. And if there's lots of buy orders sitting in the book and not too many sell orders, then he goes, well, okay, I know that future order flow is random. There's lots of buy orders, and if the orders hit there, they're not going to move the price very much. There's a wall set up by all those buy orders that keeps the price from going down too much. Sell orders, on the other hand, there's not too many of those. So same level of orders, they're going to roll right through there and really make the price move, so the price is likely to go up. So this guy plays that strategy. Next slide. And what we see here is a comparison of the spread that exists without 
this agent and the spread that exists with that agent in there where we include that agent's market order flow in the soup. And explain again what the agent does is the agent says, okay, there's lots of buy orders. I'll put in a, bar, a buy market order so that I, I buy myself and then I'll hold it for a while until I hopefully realize the price going up and then I sell it again. That's what this guy's doing. So what you see in this picture is that he is, um, well, maybe it's a sheet, I don't know, is altering the, um, the price here, the spread, by maybe, you know, 15% or something. Or no, more than that, actually, excuse me. John, yeah? Uh, did you say where the buyers are to pay that uh, order? To make money. The way you make money is you, you buy low. When, when, when you see this order imbalance build up, you, you, you buy right then and when the price is where it is, and then you at this point have a conditional forecast that given this situation, the price is likely to go up. So you hang on to it for a while, and then you sell it again. And, if you, and the strategy, I mean, you can see that, I mean, actually I, I tossed out this slide showing the guy's profits, but he actually reaches a peak in his profits around this point because indeed the, the market does tend to go up when there's far more, by limit orders, there's far more stored um, demand than there is stored supply. Clear? Okay. Um, there's no profit on the graph. I, sh I should have probably thrown that one in. There's, there's another one here. I was trying to make the graph hold something. Okay. Um, now, actually, well, let me just, let's go back. Just let me talk about this a little bit. So we're actually bothered that our predictions are so good because we really would have thought as we add in this ecology that things would shift out. Now, it could be as we really build up a more mature ecology with all of the niches filled we push ourselves something back into a world that's much more like the random world, okay? Um, but we'll see, this is an experiment in progress. Um, next slide, for, um, all right, so we're also doing other things. We're looking at various effects, measuring things from the data to make the model more realistic, to, to sort of kind of empirically look at what real agents do. Um, agents don't place their orders the way I showed you. We actually know how they do that now. And, we know that there are correlations in their performance. If they're doing one thing, they tend to be doing that thing 10 minutes later. There are also feedback effects. The agents are responding to the price, so there's an interplay between the price, and in fact, that gives bursts of volatility and lots of stuff. I, I, in the interest of trying to get you guys out of here on time, I tossed all those slides out. So um, <laughs> let's go forward. All right, I just want to emphasize one thing, though, which is kind of surprising, that is, that is Part of what we're doing that's different from the way economists look at it, we say, look, there, there's a, a need here. Markets need to store demand. Demand is not a static thing like you learn about it in the economics book. It's something that flows like water. And, and you need to store demand in order to facilitate transactions. The limit order book is just a storage device like it has persistent states. It's like a reservoir. I mean, you take a reservoir, you breach the dam, the water isn't instantaneously in the Pacific. It, it takes time to flow out. And or an electrical capacitor is another good example, except it's more complicated because you've got buy and sell, and there's really two different reservoirs, and they're interacting with each other. But, but we really think of this in a very physical way. Now, one of the, the paradoxical things about this is when we put in random order flow, we get out non-random price behavior. And our hypothesis is that as we have more intelligent agents, they will make the order flow less random, but the price is more random. But, but this idea that completely random behavior actually results in non-random output is something that I think is a little surprising to economists that realize this. Next, next slide. All right, the conclusions for this part, and then I'll go to the next part, which is a lot shorter, is that uh, market institutions are important. A detailed mechanistic model of how trading happens seems to have substantial predictive value. And to tie in with a the theme in my first lecture, you notice how mechanistic it is. I mean, there's like little atoms bouncing into each other. It's a very, I think, mechanistic view of what goes on in the market. Um, and for some purposes, randomness may be, a little, may be a better model than rationality. And so we're taking the current, the current approach in economics and program and turning it upside down. Instead of starting with rationality and detuning it, we're starting with randomness and, and throwing in a little bit of rationality. So um, next slide. Now, to transition, this is actually another prediction of our model that we're trying to test. We don't know yet how well that really works. Let me just explain it is because it ties into the next theme, which is that um, trading influences prices. So 
predictions affect the world. And this is showing some curves that illustrate as you trade more shares, how the amount you affect affects the world. Next slide. And with, okay, you don't need to know the details. Of this. And we show a variety of examples here. Let me just say that we're, we, we're trying to test against these examples. Qualitatively, it looks pretty good. We do see curves that are much flatter than economists would have predicted and that are sloping this way. They're, they're getting flatter as you go up rather than getting steeper. Everybody used to think they must get steeper and steeper as you go up. So the results are already seeming to fit. But let's go on to the next topic. OK, this can't be the whole story. I mean, what about psychology? So our feeling on long time scales, human psychology must be important. On short term, it seems that price behavior is random, but over sufficiently long term, prices have to be more rational. Um, there seem to be universal patterns of human behavior, such as speculative bubbles, that play themselves out again and again with human psychology, where reality influences perception, and perception influences reality, and there's a feedback loop. So next slide. This is a familiar recent example, the NASDAQ. Um, you see there's been a big price bubble. Prices went up by a huge factor and then dropped again for what seemed to be no um, apparent economic reasons. Next slide. This is just a longer term view of the same thing. Show the big build up to the bubble, the bubble popping and dropping back down again. Now, for, for those people that were thinking about bubbles going through this, it seemed a little bizarre. When we were up here, it was just kind of hard to believe because you know, it's, this is, this is a, uh, a mistake that people have made over and over and over again. There's a 1980 book by Charles Mackay called Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowd, Crowds, where he details all sorts of, um, of um, price bubbles. And um, going forward, this is, for example, the price of wheat in Munich in the early 1800s. You see a similar kind of bubble. Um, next slide. Price of wheat in Paris a couple of centuries before. I could, you know, um, haul out a gallery of, of 50 or 100 of these things. And of course, the problem is it's, it's always tempting to hang on here, and it's very hard to predict when this part's going to happen. So, um, and people get suckered into this over and over again. Um, I show bananas just because bananas seem about to be about the only thing <laughs> <laughs> that don't show bubbles. So, People actually think maybe this is because bananas can't be stored very long, and, and, and to really get a bubble going, you have to be able to speculate. To speculate, you have to be able to store it. But so it's it's really it seems to be speculation that drives these bubbles, and not just. I mean, of course, bubbles can also be fueled by famine and the like, but more generally, they're just fueled by by greed. Um, next slide. Now, this is just to illustrate what I said before about. On, on a long enough time scale, there are two slides here, and I, I won't say much about where it comes from, but the dot is some economist's idea of a rational valuation of the American stock market at different times, and the solid line is the price plotted on a logarithmic scale, so everything's compressed, these are actually much bigger swings than you see with your eye. And what you can see is prices can spend decades out of line with values, <coughs> at least according to this valuation formula. Now, People have spent a lot of time, time trying to find valuation formulas that fit better, and so far have not had much success. But so I'm not saying that our model describes prices over five-year time spans. Um, over long enough time spans, you see that prices do indeed tend to revert to values, but it takes you know five years to decades for that to happen. But over shorter time spans, like um, a day certainly, and possibly even we think a month or up to a year. Prices just seem to be random because, well, I don't think people can predict them very well. Um, next. All right. So, excuse me, I need to get some water again. Um, so this is the last little chapter of my talk. Um, the, the fortune teller problem. I want to focus in a little bit more on... Pardon me? Certainly. Can you yell? Yes. Uh, the show up in the sort of anomalous pattern that we identify. You mean these are the R model? 
what insider trading fell throw the model I just described off, or are there ways in general to identify insider trading? Because certainly the SEC spends a lot of time looking at looking at various things that, that allow that give them clues about when people are doing insider trading. Now, these are your model. If there were insider traders, would would that make our model fit less well? I kind of doubt it, actually, but I don't know. Yeah. No, well, our model is not particularly informative about that. Okay, so on to the next part of this. Um, and wait, I have to find something in my notes here. Um, just a minute. <coughs> okay, so now I want to talk about the fortune teller problem. That is, that predicting the future influences the future. And in particular, thinking about two kinds of forecasts. Um, one is an absolute kind of forecast. I predict that X will happen. The other is a contingent forecast, which is if you do X, if you do Y, X will happen. So they're different, and, and you know, obviously the latter kind of forecast in general is safer, but um, and, and economists, economic models generally make contingent forecasts and then try and turn those eventually into absolute forecasts. But, but let me just say the influence is weaker for contingent, contingent forecasts, but the effect is still present. Now, to get you the idea of the fortune teller problem, I want to read you a quote from um, The Crossing by uh, Cormac McCarthy. Um, if a dream could tell the future, it can also thwart that future. For God will not permit that we shall know what is to come. He is bound to no one that the world shall unfold just so upon its course, and those who by some sorcery or by some dream might come to pierce the veil that lies so darkly over all that is before them may serve by just that vision to cause that God should wrench the world from its heading and set it upon another course altogether. And then where stands the dreamer? Where stands the sorcerer? Where the dreamer and his dream? So um, next slide. Ooh, uh, excuse me. Uh, what, 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 are you, what, what are you doing here? I'm here because your aura beckons me in. Oh, <laughs> um, um, well, um, Ah, I see. Would you well, like me to tell your fortune? Well, I, sure. I, I mean, since you're here, I guess so. <laughs> Have a seat, please. Gosh, well, okay. kind of a public uh, forum to have your fortune told. But, uh, yes, yes. Okay. I see that you will be taking a trip. A trip? Where? Yes, yes. Poughkeepsie, New York. <laughs> Can't imagine why I go to Poughkeepsie, New York. But, well, is it a good trip? No. No, it is not. Oh, no? Well, well, why not? There is a train wreck. Oh, a train wreck. Ooh, that doesn't sound good. Well, well am, I, am I badly hurt? A compound fracture of the tibia near the patella. Oh, that doesn't sound very nice. Well, just just out of curiosity, I mean, is it possible that I don't go? And and um, and uh, if if I don't go, will there still be a train wreck? No, there will be no train wreck because you are the one who causes the train wreck. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, uh, probably other people get hurt too. Um, I should probably avoid, I should probably avoid that one. Well, well, so what happens if I don't go to Poughkeepsie? Hmm. You stay home. <laughs> and? And you get very bored. Well, Sounds, sounds better to me than a compound fracture of the tibia patella. And, tell it, so. and yeah. you contract a fatal disease. Well, well, that actually is fatal, huh? That that sounds worse than the tibia and patella. Um, um, yeah. Well, maybe for you. I haven't told you what happens to all of the other people on the train. Okay, well, okay, so you're saying they get hurt even worse, so I, I can't get out of this by just choosing the train instead of staying home. 
So, um, well, um, well, suppose I take a different trip. Um, wh where do I go? Where do you want to go? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, Tahiti, Tahiti um, it might be nice. Um, <laughs> would that work out? Well, the odds look good. <laughs> wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. What, what do you mean? The odds look good. You're, you're supposed to be a gypsy. You're supposed to be a gypsy, and now you're talking in terms of, of probability. It's a 1.3% to be exact. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. That doesn't sound too bad. I mean, you know, all things given here. Um, still, you know, I'm kind of worried about the 1.3%. Um, well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Look, you're supposed to be a gypsy. I mean, you're supposed to look in that crystal ball and see my fate. I mean, you're supposed to see my one true fate. Instead, you're talking about, you're talking about numbers and probabilities and all this stuff. I mean. I mean, gypsies don't do that. What about, what about Oedipus? I mean, Oedipus, Oedipus, you know, he tried, he did everything he could, could to avoid his fate, and he, he couldn't. It happened no matter what. No matter what he tried to do, he, he couldn't avoid it. So, I, what, what happened to my one true unavoidable fate? Well, why do you bring up your mother? <laughs> Her anyway. Oh, I, I like her. She's fine. I have no problem. Do with you my need mother. a psychic or a psychiatrist? I don't need. I'm just fine. I don't need a psychiatrist. Okay, okay, okay. Forget about all that. Let's get back to this fake thing. Okay. Now, have you ever heard of chaos theory? <laughs> I've not heard something about it. Where do you think free will comes from, anyway? Oh. The future. It's not completely deterministic. The slightest alteration can change everything. There are a billion tiny little possibilities that can create new futures and scatter your fate to the wind. The prediction is part of the system. The it changes the initial conditions, and these changes change the initial conditions, and on and on and on to infinity. <laughs> there is an exponentially growing number of possibilities. You ask me these stupid questions about your vacation. I can promise you it's too much to track with my crystal ball. Why don't you ask me something easier, like tomorrow's weather or where to bet on the roulette wheel? <laughs> well, because I don't want to know about roulette or the weather. You know, I want to know about my vacation. Like, like, I don't know. You know, how do, how do the flight schedules to Tahiti look? Oh, if you want to know about flight schedules, go see a travel agent. <laughs> Well, I say, I mean, do you think she was making? Wait, something a little weird going on here. Um, oh, what was happening? Aha, uh -huh. <laughs> the laptop. <laughs> Wait, I said I get my notes back. Um, so the fortune teller problem. You can see we have a problem with fortune tellers here. Um, Oh, by the way, put on, put on the next slide. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, this was, uh, no, the one with Cormac's thing. All right. No? Well, I guess you'll have to suffer with my reading of, Corm but, but um, is, is, what's the slide after this? These are my, no, back, Marcus. All right, we'll start here. Um, <laughs> Okay, I wanted to put a, oh, there it is, Cormac's words. That was what was supposed to be up while you were listening to the gypsy, just so you have, in case you were bored by Olivia, which I couldn't imagine it would be. Um, anyway, I, I like these words. Um, uh, though, you know, I have to say, my, my son Eli had written this and showed it to me. I would have made him put a few commas in there, but, you know, not Cormac, so 
Just shows who was right now. Anyway, go on. No, I'm just kidding. Next slide. All right, now what I'm about to do is show you a little model that we made up for um, feedback between perception and reality. So the idea is that some, it's a sports betting game, an idealized sports betting game. So for example, you have N agents, and these N agents bet on some event at time P, like a horse race. And the odds are based on a net wager on each outcome. That is, if a lot of people bet on that horse, that horse isn't going to pay off very good odds. If almost no one bets, the odds become really good if you win. Now, we, the difference between what we're going to do here and the normal standard model is that we're going to allow for the possibility that the outcome is influenced by the odds. Financial markets provide a good example because, because well, supply and demand, particularly demand, are inherently subjective things. They're determined by human preferences and prices, prices move in response to those preferences and whether you win or lose your bet depends on, on that psychologically driven thing, which in turn can alter reality because, for example, if the price of something goes up, then investment capital goes up, then widgets of the type that those guys want to build get built, and if the opposite happens, the price goes down and those widgets don't get built. So, there's this feedback between our perceptions of reality and what reality really does. The simplest case, well, so for this model, back to this model, that we're going to reduce it to just a coin flip. So we imagine there's a coin, so there's only two outcomes, but we'll let the coin respond to the odds on heads versus tails. It's like a, a jockey that's responding to the odds because if the odds get too good, he might decide to throw the race, except in this case, it's just it's like a smart coin. Um, so now I'm going to show, um, next slide, these are just my collaborators on this project. Seth Lloyd, who's a professor of mechanical engineering at MIT, and Jonathan Goler, who's an undergraduate there. Um, next slide. Marcus, we need to see the maps before this picture here. Um, you know, the pit, the map, okay, yeah, good. So this is what an objective coin would be like. This would be a coin that's unaffected by the odds. So the idea here is that the subjective bias is the net, that's how much people bet on heads over here versus tails over here. And if half the people bet on heads and half bet on tails, then the subjective bias is in the middle. If more people bet on heads, it starts to move over this direction. Now this is the real bias, the objective bias. This is what the coin really does. As you can see in this case, the coin is always a fair coin. It always stays at 50-50 for heads or tails. Next slide. Now this is a coin that's like an efficient market. And that what happens in this case is as more people bet on heads, the payoff to heads, the probability that heads comes up goes down. So the coin gets biased in such a way as to thwart its future, uh, as in Cormac's quote. Um, now I've sketched in this identity line just to show you that what I'm going to do, if, if you think of this map happening, the point that remains invariant is the 50-50 point for an unbiased coin. So if you imagine that what we're going to do is we're going to explore cases where we start out with an objective coin, and then we're going to play around with a map between the odds and reality, we're going to leave this point here invariant so that if, if reality is, if this feedback loop between reality and perception is stable, everything will stick at this point. But if that feedback loop isn't stable, it'll blow away and go somewhere else. So next slide. Okay, so this is an example of a positive feedback world where as the subjective bias increases, um, actually the identity line would already be an example of this, whereas the probability of betting on heads increases, sorry, as more people bet on heads, the coin becomes biased towards heads. The identity line would do that this curve also does, does this. It turns out, um, and this is fresh work, and I should probably have a few more explanatory slides, but we were able to prove that under some cases, this point is a Nash equilibrium. So a lot of you probably saw a beautiful mind, and I think they mumbled one little line about what that was in there. What it means is that, um, is that at a Nash equilibrium, it's the player, it's the place where you can defend your bet in the sense that somebody playing your same strategy against you can't beat you. And in the case that we see here, that Nash equilibrium becomes destabilized. So now, Marcus, if we could show those, um, those colored pictures that you were about to flash on. Now, I have to admit that we were frantically graphing these today, and I haven't even seen them. 
So um, and what we have here, and remind me if, well, Marcus will have to scream from the booth if I'm wrong, um, is time is going, is it going this way, Marcus? This way, yeah. And so the, the different agents are going this way, ranging from the agents that are betting entirely on tails to entirely on heads, and the amount of space they take up represents how much of the money they have at this time. So what you can see is in this world, this orange guy and this guy here end up splitting all the money at the end of the run. Um, and they're both coming from around here somewhere, so they both come out of roughly the same probability. Um, actually, let me, we could read it off of the little, uh, okay. Well, I don't quite see the, oh yeah, there they are. So these are guys that are both making bets that are very close to, um, to all tails. tails. Tails, as you recall, is at one end of the probability spectrum. That is, this is an unstable world in which the, um, the feedback was positive. If you start to bet on heads, heads gets more likely, and it's so strong that you blast off to just pegging the coin onto heads, or maybe it's tails. You peg it on tails. And in fact, in these kind of worlds, one of the things you see is that the final outcome is indeterminate. The first few coin flip flips determine which way you go. If the first few coin flips happen to favor the guys that are betting on tails, then they start to grab all the money. They bet on tails even more, which weights the odds toward tails, which then causes the coin to become more likely to make tails, which then gives those guys even more money on average, and so it just goes off in the coin. That is, reality collapses in this kind of a picture. And we can, we're really, um, Marcus, you want to play another one? Do you, do you have another one of those, or is that the only one? That's the only one. It doesn't really matter. I mean, actually, so what we see actually satisfies our predictions, and, and um, which is that, that the coin will actually tolerate a certain amount of positive feedback. That is, this feedback between betting on heads and having the coin be more likely for heads, we can tolerate a certain amount of that and keep the reality of the coin being unbiased stable. But if we turn that up too much, there's a critical point where everything collapses and the coin turns into a completely biased coin that either bets on, on always comes up heads or always comes up tails because that's what people perceive that it's going to do. Now, so to summarize this part, um, if you're able to create reality, it becomes difficult to know, well, this is maybe going beyond it, I'm not summarizing, what reality even is. That is, in a world where you're making predictions and you're altering the world around you, and if you think about it, you know, our world is increasingly artificial. More and more of it, if, as you go through your day, ask yourself, how many of the things I'm seeing around me are, are artifacts? How many are artificially created objects? How much of my environment is being artificially controlled? And how much time do I spend on object in, in, around in, in a material world that is unaffected by human behavior? The answer is, is well, really the answer is none because we're affecting everything on the globe right now. But, but um, as our world becomes more artificial and as we create the world more and more in the essence of what we desire, that's like saying, I want, um, I want the coin to be heads and I'm going to bet on heads. Um, if, if that feedback becomes positive, there's danger of that reality becoming unstable because there's these feedback loops between our predictions of the world, our, or our desires, our predictions of the world, what we create, and, and, and what our desires are. And these feedback loops can vastly complicate the dynamics. In a world where you're affecting the world all the time, you have to make yourself part of the prediction. In an economic world where you're affecting prices, you have to factor that into your model, and that vastly complicates the modeling process. It creates, I, I believe, what could be called a danger of a kind of societal schizophrenia where we lose track of, in a sense, what reality is and, and what we want. Um, next slide. I just want to show, you know, very familiar example to everybody. This is the temperature of the Earth. Uh, this is from the recent uh, study by the National Academy of Science. This is the temperature of the Earth as best estimated over the last millennium. And you can see that the temperature moves in a complicated way, and then there's a sudden rise. 
Now, it's been very difficult to untangle whether this sudden rise is human caused or not. We know we're affecting the world. We have to model, we have to have a good model of the world in order to, to, to unravel that. And we have to be able to separate out the already substantial natural variation that's going about on back here from whatever artificial variation we might be imposing here. One thing we do know that we're, we're changing in a major way is next slide. This is the CO2 level over a similar period. Um, it's risen dramatically in the last couple of centuries. And, and we know that that change is caused by human behavior. And we know that CO2 has a big effect on temperature and the rest of the planet. We don't know exactly what that effect, effect is. So we're dealing with a situation where we're, this feedback is, is because the feedback involves what is it? I mean, in, to engage in the purposeful behavior that we like to engage in to do things like have automobiles, to manipulate our worlds, to, uh, to suit our, 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 our needs of, well, in the long run, I, propagation writ large of society. Well, I'll, I'll come back into that, that tomorrow in the, the final lecture. But, but to satisfy our perceived needs, we're making a big change in our world. We're trying to forecast what that change is. And the huge uncertainties in the forecasts are generating huge risk that we may destroy the very thing that, that, um, well, that we like so much. Now, um, or at least change it in a radical way that may not be advantageous to us and certainly may not be advantageous to us. So let me just summarize the evening's lecture. Um, prediction's a key element of purposeful behavior coming out of propagation. I haven't actually talked about that, that so much. I'll admit I did somewhat shoehorn this lecture into the fact that I really wanted to talk about prediction. But, but um, I've tried to illustrate the, the different ways of making predictions and, um, and give you some flavor for the, the, the kind of uh, uh, the, the, the form those kind of predictions take and the kind of things they can do. And this is the last point I was making, that as the sophistication of predictions increases, the effect on the environment can make prediction more, more difficult and for humans create a danger of social schizophrenia, like market manias and global warming. Thank you. I have to apologize. I realize I went even longer tonight. But <laughs> Sorry about that. Tomorrow night, I'll try the third time. <laughs> By the way, there'll be questions in a, in a minute as soon as people get I worked hard to pare the lecture down, timed myself beforehand, it timed in at about a minute and 15, one hour and 15 minutes, and uh, there you go. Um, yep. As a result of your research, should we be buying or selling? I, I would not want to take the responsibility for your buying and selling. Um, I am not, uh, I am certainly not buying. Um, yeah. What does this do over the long term to a person who wants to invest following the uh, modern portfolio theory with using efficient markets? Well, if you believe the modern portfolio theory, then you should just go buy something that simulates the S&P index or better diversification, get some kind of world index that combines stocks and bonds and lots of other things, um, um, if, if you believe that theory, which, which I don't. But, but you know, I, I will say that for most people, I think it's pretty dangerous to go out and play the market. I mean, I, I don't, um, you know, uh, the market has, is full of surprises, and what Prediction Company did is one of those uh, don't try this at home kind of things, you know, um, it involved uh, staff with, with, you know, 10 or 20 people to begin with and lots of computer equipment and lots of PhDs and so on. Uh, as a simple couch potato way of investing, uh, yours would be too complicated for the average individual. Yeah. Yeah. So would the efficient market, if you call it it, be a good first step? You know, it's a reasonable thing to do. With your uh, theory, is there a way, uh, can you uh, gauge how is the best way to affect the price of 
movement of the stock by, by buying and selling at a certain, at a certain timing? Uh, yeah, but the, you know, the, I don't. The computer does that. I don't. I don't even. You know, I don't even know what's up or down on any given day. Let's take questions that don't involve financial advice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, do you have a paper out or your explanation of how you use the, the, the five factors and everything? Oh, yes, we do have a few papers out. Um, they're they're fairly technical papers. Um, we're, we're in the process of writing a paper that will be more for, well, it will be a review article, it still won't be a general public. It'll, it's probably going to be a while before we write a more uh, general public oriented piece on this. Yeah, you, you can get, you can, you, come to, you can look at my website, for example. We post, I post the papers there as soon as they're done. So uh, it's, it's um, if you go to the Santa Fe website, just look for, you know, people and if you can find my website pretty easily. Yes? What happens in fluid flow, where you reach a certain embodied energy or velocity in that case, where you change from laminar flow to turbulent flow in the kind of ecologies you're talking about? Yeah, in some cases there may be. I mean, um, the market itself, if you want to think about it in terms of turbulence, it's very developed, high Reynolds number turbulence. It's not anywhere near the transition. And, and, and yet it's worse, as I said, because of this feedback due to the efficient market. Now, it is true that in, in, in uh, some situations, like, like well, in that model that I was showing for the feedback between subjective and objective reality uh, in the betting game, there are certain critical points where the behavior dramatically changes and you go from nice stable behavior to behavior that's sensitively dependent on the fluctuations that happen at the beginning. So, so yes, there are some analogies, but you know, the analogies are a little weak in general. Are you using your models? Speak up. Are you using your models to make more predictions about the use of the environment of the planet? Oh, not. I mean, the model. The model. That, I don't know when you say models. Which, which ones do you mean? I, I'm not engaged in that right now, though. Actually, there is an effort that may be starting up at SFI to try and synthesize a people who are working in different areas relating to problems of the political, um, economic. Uh, ecological problems, trying to synthesize those views together, and I hope to be involved in that project. Um, you know, I don't think the models that I, I gave here bear on this bigger question very directly. Although, I do think that it is socially, if, if indeed we can predict volatility and give insight into, about, into what causes volatility, we can then give insight into how to design markets to decrease volatility, which I think most people would, be, would view as a very good thing. And so I do think there may act, even from something as simple as that, some societal benefit. Yeah? Uh, in, your, in your model, which there were some uh, traders uh, sort of randomly making limit orders and some traders making market orders, were there sort of, was there a critical ratio of the two that created an unstable uh, equilibrium? Um, uh, let me see if I understand the question. So the question is, in, in the model, is there some ratio of market order and limit order placement that makes things unstable? Well, the answer is, that's actually one of the reasons why it's so critical to have the order cancellation process in the model. Because if nobody ever cancels an order, if more people are placing, say, limit orders than market orders, then the orders just build up and build up and build up without bound, and, certain, and prices would never move anymore. Conversely, if more market orders are being placed than limit orders, then the book is basically always almost flat. The market's extremely volatile. You put in this cancellation process, it means that even without the market orders, the limit order, the depth in the market builds up to some sensible place so that you get sensible responses to prices. And so the answer is, if you take delta to zero, you do get an instability, under, and, and particularly when you have extreme imbalances of either one. I don't know if that's what you were asking for. Uh, okay. Let's take one more. Yeah, question? Are, are bubbles in financial markets contemporaneous and predictable? That is, can you, I, I know you can't tell when you're gonna fall off, but can you tell when you're starting to climb on? It looks like a double exponential. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I sure felt in 1998 like we were in a bubble, and I, you know, lots of, lots of people did. 
Um, the problem is there's no like there's no stone tablet that says we are in a bubble. And if you read the paper around that period, there were pe plenty of people, you know, helium suckers who were like Marcus, and uh, you know, that we're in a new world. And you know, one of the amazing things is you go back through the the, the record and. Almost every bubble, there's a crowd of people saying, this world is different from the old world. It's a new regime, it's a whole new kind of industry. It's gonna change things in a fundamental way. And, and so yes, I think there are a lot of signs you're in bubbles. Um, and maybe it will be that as we will someday get more astute about this. And, and, and so bubbles will diminish. Now one of the problems in my view is that mainstream economists do not actually try to build models that predict bubbles. Because, because think about what you have to do that. You have to have some kind of model of psychology. And that's only recently become fashionable in economics. You have to have a model that involves dynamics and get, captures this feedback. And you're just talking about a lot of stuff that economists, just, they, they, they don't like those words. You, 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 know, you start saying those kind of things to them and they just edge away from you and, uh, and say, you know, sorry. Um, they're not viewed as acceptable ideas in modern economics. You, you have a very hard time getting models like that published, and there's very little effort going into some such models, which is a pity because uh, it seems like a very useful thing to do.